You're listening to the Men in Blazers Media Network, Suboptimal Radio. There's nothing better than seeing a, a goal next to your name and knowing that no one's going to remember how easy it was. But there you go. You got another one. <laughs> it's Rog back with another episode of the Women's Game presented by Paramount Plus. And here with me this week, it's only one of the best human beings I know, a woman who has shown herself unafraid to offend Thierry Henry on live television, goal scorer, podcaster, greatest person to book in from Gotham FC and your US women's national team. It's the one and only Midge Purse. That gets me every time. Thank you. <laughs> it's truer and truer every time, but we are speaking in a week of weeks, Midge. How is this not a national holiday? You had a birthday yesterday. (laughs) I did have a birthday yesterday. It was fantastic. We got home at 3 a.m. from our loss against Washington Spirit. (laughs) 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 The morning of my birthday. (laughs) Oh, crappy birthday, Midge. Crappy birthday. Talk us through the the happy parts, though. Because I do believe the world is divided into two kinds of people. There's those who don't care about the birthday and those who expect a Viking feast that goes on for a week or more. Can you place yourself somewhere within that spectrum? Yes. Like most most things, it is a spectrum. <laughs> and <laughs> I, am, I am more towards the I don't care about my birthday. And I don't. But then people show me love on my birthday. And I think, you know, maybe I do care <laughs> more than I thought. <laughs> As it should be. You know, my birthday is September the 14th. We are both. We are both both Virgos, Edge. You know, male Virgos are very different, I hear, though. (laughs) There's a thing called Google, which I hit very hard just before you came on. And it just says, it doesn't do the male-female thing. It just says Virgos, logical, practical, and systematic in their approach to life. The earth sign is a perfectionist at heart and isn't afraid to improve skills through consistent practice. That's not me. That is not me at all. That, is really? that you? Well, yeah, it's me. I'm Slytherin. I'm an earth like person. <laughs> not in the way you think. Like I'm not really in tune with the earth, but I'm like very pragmatic, stubborn, logical, very black and white. It's how I see things. Does, is this resonating with the male Virgo in you? Some of these, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> and now that, the, la- the last one, seeing things very black and white, yeah, that's very wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you just enlighten me for a minute about the male Virgo, though? I'm genuinely fascinated. Yes. So full disclosure, I know very little about horoscopes and all of this. Um, but apparently, <laughs> uh, yeah, I only really know about Virgos, which apparently is very Virgo of me to know only about Virgos. (laughs) But as I said, I I hear, all I hear, the streets are saying that female Virgos are fantastic, but male Virgos are abysmal to be around. And that is just all I've been hearing when I keep my ear to the streets. That's all. Well, on the on the small (laughs) sample group of this podcast, that actually holds completely true. So... Who knows? For more on this, tune into Midge and my other podcast, Astrology Today. But Midge, a delightful surprise last week. I was watching my Champions League football when who showed up magically, zooming in on the big screen to talk, amongst other things, about a childhood love of Manchester United that I didn't know. It was you, Midge. Can you talk me through this one a little bit? How, How? Well, first of all, How is it zooming into the Champions League halftime show? Oh, it's so fun. I love Kate and she makes it so easy. She is also a Virgo to no surprise. Is that true? Yes. Hang on. Let me me just remember Virgo women, awesome. Virgo men, (laughs) utter bag of crap. Okay, got it. So she's a Virgo woman. She's a Virgo. Kate Abdo, amazing. We're adding to the credibility of Virgo women. Kate Abdo. That's, I mean, (laughs) that's a great, great call up. I don't know when Jamie Carragher's birthday is, but I'm sure he's, he, he, he probably holds two for your Virgo men as well there. Are you, but they're all in the studio doing their bants, ready to go. They can all look at each other and you're just like zooming in, just kind of out of normal with the, you know, the sound delays. And is it not nerve wracking? 
The first time I did it, it was nerve wracking, but now it's just kind of fun. I think the scariest thing is I have these windows in my living room where I do most of my media. As you can see, my lovely kitchen behind here. I always set up my flowers in the picture so you can see. These new white roses are courtesy of my boyfriend for my birthday. So yeah. Not a Virgo. Uh, Good guy. <laughs> no, no, no. He's a he's an Aries. <laughs> I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> Another Virgo thing for me to say. I don't I don't know. <laughs> but uh it's it's not very nerve-wracking. It's very exciting. Kate always makes it easy and fun. But my windows, back to my windows. My windows, they have blinds on the bottom parts, but the top, there's nothing to cover the sun. So if you watch that, you see me trying to shift in and out of the sunlight as the sun goes down, and it looked terrible absolutely horrible but that's that's usually my biggest concern the lighting it was the, it was the content which was really quite fascinating to me as someone that loves talking to you you revealed something that i've never heard before your childhood love of manchester united and i'm like oh midge we've got to talk about that one how early does it go back what era are we talking and generally why would you do that to yourself yeah, I mean, there's a reason you haven't heard it. I <laughs> I don't <laughs> like to talk about it a lot. It's been a really difficult commitment for me. And that's why I kind of keep it to myself, just waiting for a time where I can really, really be proud of the relationship and, and hanging in there. But it, di it didn't start super young. I... Most people who know anything about me know that I didn't know much about soccer until the national team, which is which was a bit older. But when I played when I was little, my dad just randomly got me a Man U jersey. It didn't have anyone's name on it. It was just a random Man U jersey. So when I did watch, I watched Man U. And that's how I became a Man U fan. It's probably a Christian Press Man U <laughs> shirt, if I'm guessing. But there are two types of American footballers. Those who grew up obsessed with global football, just tapping into illegal streams of Premier League games back in the day and those who came to the game purely by playing it and weren't exposed to the larger world of football until much later in their development you were clearly one of the latter and I'm fascinated how how do you feel that makes your game different to or is there any difference between those who are really obsessed and watched and those who who just learned by doing I think for my generation, there's not much a difference between the ones who just fell in love inherently with the game by playing it versus those who lived the global world of football from a very young age. But I think now, I think there's a huge difference. I think this next and upcoming generation with the technology basically expanding the world of football for kids, no matter where you are, you can pull up Instagram, TikToks, learn, learn skills from anyone. You can see workouts, you can see nutrition, you can see the best goals in 30 seconds from an entire EPL weekend and you don't have to watch all the games. I think that definitely changes the approach to the game and, and makes it a lot better for kids today. Manchester United's women's side, quick plug, you can catch them on Sunday, taking on West Ham in the Women's Super League, streaming all season long on Paramount+. Plus. They are a relatively new team. The club controversially ignored the entire women's game for the longest time until they buckled. Now San Diego Wave head coach Casey Stoney was the founder that really built the club from scratch. But they're now making huge strides as the Women's Super League in England continues to gain momentum season on season after this great summer of three Lioness glory. The excitement crackling around that league is, is really, it's an incredible time to be alive to witness as a, a bloke who grew up in England with the women's game really existing in the shadows. And I'm fascinated in the locker rooms of the NWSL, what level of talk has the Women's Super League's return triggered? You know, is the conversation amongst players thinking, wow, that looks over there, that looks amazing? Oh, always. We always get excited when that league starts over there. It's something for us to watch that we're invested in. Not that UPL and Champions League for the men isn't fun to watch, but it is a different game. It's, it's, it's exciting and it offers a different visual of football that is really, really entertaining. And we also have friends who've played over there. You know, Caitlin Ford is over there. I played with her at the Portland Thorns. You have Ellie Carpenter coming back from ACL tear. You, it's just, it's 
really exciting to watch and I think we all can't wait for Champions League. <laughs> a lot of US national team players have done stints in England over the years, some shorter than others. Is that on your radar, even peripherally at all, the long-term purse bucket list? Yeah, you know, everything's an option. I, I think about a lot what my career is going to look like and I definitely don't have any doors closed. Midge Purse in England. God, that, that is a mind-blowing concept. The real queen finally descending <laughs> upon the United Kingdom. I do remember interviewing Sam Lewis when she was in Manchester, mm -hmm. and she talked at length about how dispiritingly small she and Rose Lavelle found their English washing machine. <laughs> I, I remember when they were in Man City, and that is a topic that never came up, <laughs> but... It's good to know. I remember it's being like, what are the complications? And she was just like, the washing machines, they are tiny. They are befuddling. And I just imagine the two of them just killing it on the field and off the field, just not being able to work out how to get clean clothes. But the other revelation from that interview, because CBS likes to keep things bouncy and deeply personal, your youthful crush on Robin Van Persie did make me curious because we've never talked about this before. Who were your personal on-field football idols growing up, men or women? It's very interesting that you asked that. I'm not really an idol person, to be quite honest. I see attributes and characteristics that I like amongst multiple player, players from different positions, positions that aren't even mine. And I am a bandwagon person. I jump and hop <laughs> from favorite to favorite. It depends on the time of the day, what the weather is like, who's at the top. So I can't say that I had a particular one. God, I, I love this. I love how deeply you've, you've drilled into this. Not an idle person but a bandwagon person. 100%. Like, what, what attributes? Give us an example of someone you used to watch as young midge person be like, that, I want that in my game. <laughs> Marcelo. He's just so creative, so entertaining. I've actually found that some of the best games I've had are when I think to myself, be entertaining. And it just brings a different level of creativity that I think he, I think he's the quintessential creative player. He's not even a forward, but he just is, oh, it's just, it's crazy. It's just fun to watch. You love it. So Marcelo for sure, Van Persie, obviously that header, that header will never leave my, my memory. It's ingrained, it's imprinted. The one against Spain. Is there another? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I see it as clear as day now. I remember sitting in my living room watching that and I just said, yeah, I'm not good in the air, but that's nice. <laughs> If, if I could, that would be what I'm shooting for. But you have to know your strengths. <laughs> you have to know your weaknesses. The Marcelo thing, I spent some time with Marcelo and he is a, a sweet and as lovely a bloke, a joyous human being as you would imagine he would be from judging him by his football. What happens when you flick that switch, be entertaining mentally and also in terms of your play? I think one, you have significantly more fun, but two, you don't look at the game with the same rigid mind that coaching can often make you look at it. Coaches often, they're like, you need to hit this space, you need to hit this pocket, you need to check here, check there. And it's very calculated for them. And it, it can really put a lens over the game that takes away your creativity. And I think when you think be entertaining, you're thinking about doing the stuff you would do in a pickup game, you know, having fun, things that, you know, you go into your friend's face and you're like, I got you. That's so embarrassing on your part. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can't forget that sports is the entertainment business. You know, I think people tend to forget that, you know, it's my job for sure, but it's also an entertainment industry. And that's the point. Obviously, I want to win and do everything, but we're here to be entertaining. And I think players who are special, like an Ashley Sanchez, like a Rose Lavelle, you know, I think it's their responsibility to bring that type of entertainment to every game. Oh, God, Speed, I love that. Flick that entertainment switch whenever you can, Midge Purse. And when I think about you know, Van Persie in his pomp, you know, I also think about how much football has changed since then. And I do want to talk for a moment about, I mean, one of those changes, which I think is something that you've long championed and dedicated your time too, which is diversity on the field, really in the American game, on the national team. You are co-founder of the Black Women's Player Collective. 
And I'm curious, thinking back to the United States teams that you grew up watching, idolizing, you know, the 2007 World Cup, you would have been like 11. I think it had two African-American women out of 21 on the squad. Can you talk about what that recognition felt like when you clocked it as a kid? When I was younger, as you said, there wasn't a lot of representation of anyone who was not white. And the truth of the matter is that's really the standard across industries, across the entire entertainment industry, even when you look into movies and TV and modeling and ads and things like that. So that was actually just the standard reality of the world that I was living in. That being said, when you do see Sidney LaRue score four or five goals, when you see Crystal Dunn just dogging it out and shutting down people on the flank, I can't really explain it. It's, it's this nuanced insight revelation that you have. It just makes it salient to you that this is definitely possible for you. It, it's almost a subconscious, like, look at it. You can be it. It's not insane for you to think. Whereas a lot of the time, you just have to accept that you're insane. <laughs> and that's great. That's great. And it's amazing to have that kind of confidence and that ability. And that's kind of what Crystal had to do. That's what Shannon Box had to do. That's what Brianna Scurry had to do. They had to see it for themselves. They had to create the picture for themselves. But it's a lot easier when, you know, you just have to color in the lines and the the borders there. We have a pod with my mate Tyler Adams and it's something that he returns to passionately and often the need for more accessibility in American youth soccer. You know, the obvious ones getting rid of pay to play, better coaching um, in more areas. And here's my question. Midge Purse, if you were US soccer czar of diversity, what would your number one move be? Oh, my first move. I mean, is this a world with no laws where I can literally do whatever I want? I think you've just described modern America. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, but go on. I, I think you said it, to be honest. For me, pay to play is the real driver of this intense inequity and talent and skill. And it's ultimately holding back the nation in terms of where it could be globally. So for me, that that's the biggest thing I'd, I'd change. God, I love that idea, actually. Midge Purse for soccer czar of diversity to the football. And I don't want to dwell on this because I imagine it's still quite raw. I'm going to whisper it with Gotham being out of playoff contention. That loss to Kansas City two weeks ago meant that your season officially ends on October the 1st. This is actually only your second ever NWSL season where you have not made the playoffs. I wonder, how, the, how does that feel? The, 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 the kind of disappointment you feel not making the playoffs versus, say, going out in the first round. Does it feel different or is a loss a loss no matter when it comes? It feels completely different. It's deafening. It kills your, your season, you know? And again... To the fans, this is the entertainment industry, and, and we're here to entertain, obviously. But for me, this is my career. This is a year that I'm dedicating to putting out the best football that I can. I am addicted to winning. I get a dopamine hit every time we get three points, and I'm chasing it every week. So to be out of that contention, to not be able to compete, which is – you know, what I've dedicated this entire year to, it it hurts. To life without that dopamine hit of three points, three points, three points, it's essentially, there's a numbness that kicks in during the season. It's just more like reopening a wound over and over again. It doesn't get easier. It actually hurts and scars more each time you lose and, and you miss out and you're just trying to do the best you can to, to turn it around and Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it this year, but this league is so insane. You had Washington Spirit, who was in last place or close to last place two years ago, won the entire league last year. And this year, we just played them the other day and we were competing for last place. So you have no idea where it's going to go. And that gives me hope. <laughs>
<laughs> hope in the darkness. Well, the, way, the way you describe that, the wound that reopens week after week, you just, I, I've rarely heard anybody describe being an Everton fan in more poetic and truthful terms. I'm just like, respect. I kind of know how you feel. But how do you cope with that disappointment mentally? After the Euros, we had Nadia Nadim come on and she said she couldn't sleep for almost a week after Denmark was knocked out. Is there a grieving period for you? Do you stay in the present and, and focus on making the most of the rest of the season? Like how do you process it? How do you handle it? Absolutely. It's not a it's not binary at all. It's definitely an ongoing, constant process that doesn't even end when the season ends. You go into the off season and you're thinking about last year and how am I going to change next year and prevent that from being like last year. And you know, I think that's why mental health globally is such a focused and prioritized topic these days. It, it's hard. And there are different tools for different people. But I think for me, one of the things that I try to remind myself is that when I am can get to my best, when I'm playing confidently and, and doing the absolute best I can, I'm really proud of that. This past weekend, so another victim swatted down in this Hunger Games of a playoff race. The Washington Spirit, they won this weekend, but an hour later found they were bumped out of contention anyway. After the rain beat North Carolina, the Spirit out of the playoffs, trying to land the plane softly after a season of true turbulence. Psychically, yeah, you know, you've talked about how this this league is so crazy. You can be last and then jump into first. You can be champions and then implode. How important does it matter about keeping pushing these last few games, end the season on the good run? Does the end of one season feed into how a team starts its next, or is it irrelevant? I don't think it's completely irrelevant. I think it feeds in, but the truth of the matter is every year you have no idea who and what the team is going to be next year. You don't know who the coach is going to be, the assistant coaches who are going to be there, is who the GM is going to be, is your lineup going to change? Are they going to trade away all the players? Are they going to bring in internationals? Are they going to completely change the style and the approach? So it's not sub-zero in terms of how it affects next year but it, I don't think it affects next year by too much that being said I think and for me it's what defines a winner and a loser to be quite honest in the sense that we have lost yes we are all losers however there is a bigger philosophical form of being a loser and to me, it is definitely people who just wash their hands of giving their effort and trying to win at anything that you possibly can. So in terms of not being a loser, yes, it matters. God, you, you can come and speak to any graduating class that I'm involved <laughs> in any time. I adore, I adore these human truths. But elsewhere in the league, Orlando Pride barreling towards playoff elimination. But because of just how tight the point situation is this season, they are still hanging in, at least for the moment. They lost 2-0 to Racing Louisville Friday night. The great Jessica McDonald's 175th league appearance. She celebrated with a glorious assist. Really an inch-perfect cross into the box, which Nadia Nadim barely had to brush to tap in for Louisville's first of the night. Jess McDonald. Still the NWSL's all-time assist leader and still in my eyes, truly underrated. She has such an incredible talent for finding the right pass. And Midge, as a goal scorer, can you describe what that feels like just sitting in the box and receiving that kind of perfect cross, which almost scores itself? Yeah, I talked about the dopamine hit and it's, it's a good hit. <laughs> you know, just standing there and you're like, oh, I'm about to score. It's going to happen. What an easy, easy way to get this ball in here. It, it literally, those words cross my mind the entire way the ball is coming. And there's nothing better than seeing a, a goal next to your name and knowing that no one's going to remember how easy it was. But there you go. <laughs> you got another one. <laughs> History doesn't show. History just counts. But Jess McDonald, how is she still so underrated? Truthfully, I have no idea. I mean, she's a World Cup champion. 
She's, I don't even know how many times she's won the NWSL championship. She's been in the top 10 scoring on the scoring board for so long. I think Jess is incredibly underrated as well. And I think she's a great player. Some stunning goals this weekend. Talking of history, remembering only the number, not the style. Louisville rookie Savannah Damello had a beauty when she launched from the top of the box to close that game out for Louisville. But a glory was stolen Saturday by the set piece queen herself, Megan Rapino, banging one in off a long range free kick that squeaked around the courage wall and passed Casey Murphy at the near post to clinch a win for the rain over North Carolina. Midge, the ability to score off a set piece is such a specific singular skill, often separate from the other types of goal scoring prowess, but it's a skill that tends to be so hard for players to articulate what they do. I remember once asking David Beckham about the calculations he made when he took a free kick because I'd read a piece about by a nuclear physicist about how he computes trajectory, wind speed, angle, goalkeeper positioning, the wall, and, and, the, and the, the physicist wrote something like that David Beckham must have the brain computing ability of a NASA scientist. And I asked him, and he's go, he just said something like, I don't really make any at all. I just go with my gut. And I was like, wow, holy crap. Can you describe from your perspective, what's the intangible that allows some players to just thrive with the dead ball? I have no idea. I'm not a set piece. <laughs> what do they call them? A set piece. Specialist. Yes, I am no set piece specialist. You don't, you don't have a black belt in set piecery. I, I do not. It, it's not my specialty. They don't even look at me when they're like, who's who's over the ball? I don't even get to be the little dummy player that goes over the ball when you take a set piece. <laughs> I'm immediate, I I like mark the keeper or I, I stand off sides to try to move the line down. Why is that? I'm fascinated. So you have so many bloody skills as a finisher. Can you just articulate what is it that allows you to do that, but not that, if you know what I mean? Again, it's the intangible. I just, I don't have it. It's, you know, some people are really fast and some people are slow. I just, I don't have it. My theory is, here's my theory. Please. Somewhere along your youth upbringing, you started kicking the ball correctly. At a time when your coach could neither decipher whether or not you had good technique you were kicking it well, and other people weren't. And from then on, you were able to just kick it well. And now you are really good at kicking it well. And I think it just it's just the skill you pick up when you're young. And truth be told, when I was young, I didn't have great coaches. I hope they don't listen to this. <laughs> when I was young, I didn't have great youth coaches that perfected technique. So... I didn't really work on my finishing technique until I was a lot older and it's too late. Can't be a technique specialist. That's absolutely fascinating. I mean, they're, they're just that how at that certain age, Arsene Wenger always talks about how the basics, the fundamentals are baked in by like the age of 11 or 12. And in your case, it's true. And if Midge's youth coaches are listening, she doesn't mean you. She means the other ones. That's all <laughs> I'll say. But the rain are now sitting almost comfortably in fifth place. They sadly lost Tobin Heath to knee surgery last week. She will be out cruelly for the rest of the season. Big love to her. And a big win for the Houston Dash this weekend in Chicago. Moving into second, off an audacious ebony salmon chip. I feel like we mention her name every single week over a listener. To my mind, the fact that the Dash have never made the playoffs before has to be one of the most striking testaments to the quality of the league over the past eight years because they've often been quite good. But for them, going into postseason with no previous playoff experience, is that a handicap culturally within an organ? You know, Pep Guardiola always talks about the problem for Manchester City in the Champions League. They've not done it before. They've not won it before. You need that kind of muscle memory as a club. And I'm always fascinated because it's different bloody players in that locker room at one time. But for him... The, the past does seep through into the present. And even though the Dash won the Challenge Cup in 2020 and they've looked great all season, how are the playoffs a different animal? You know, I love Pep, so I don't like to challenge or undermine him. That being said, 
I really think that it's almost a strength for the dash. I think that sometimes when you're a bit naive about things, it takes away anxiousness. All you have left is grit and just passion to win it. And I think that's where they are. Oh, God willing. Big love to everyone in Houston. Other goal of the weekend that really stood out for me. Haley Mace ripping a free kick in the final minute of stoppage time with a slight deflection to snatch a draw from the jaws of defeat for Kansas City. Playing Portland in a game where both teams were vying for a return to the top of the table. Everyone walking away empty-handed on that count. But what a game. What a climax. What a goal. Mid, something you've talked a little bit about before. How the joy of a goal for you depends entirely on its context in a game. And stoppage time free kick equaliser. Theoretically, where does that rank? Oh, that's euphoric. The fact that it's off a set piece... You know, I didn't even see that it ricocheted, but all I saw was top bins and ugh, the stadium roared. I felt like I was there when I saw the highlight. Entire team just surrounds and embraces Hay. Hey, Haley can rip it. She's done it for years in the league, <laughs> no matter where she's playing, whether she's playing forward, outside back or center back. She takes shots outside of the box and has just scored bangers. But I think this one has to be her top three for sure. Oh, I think the roar in the stadium was just solely from Becky Sauerbrunn at the end. God bless in every regard. But last, but definitively not least, we're going to talk about the PS de Resistance of the weekend. Really the heart-lifting, record-breaking, sold-out 32,000 plus in attendance at the California Derby in San Diego's brand new Snapdragon Stadium in which the Wave beat Angel City 1-0 ahead of from 17-year-old Jaden Shaw. But my God, the, 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 just the spectacle of the game itself. Jill Ellis, former US Women's National Team head coach, now president of the Wave, has said that the club is expecting to average fifteen to 20,000 fans a game next season, which puts it on par with the Thorns and Angel City. Midge, when you see that scene, first of all, as a player, what emotions do you experience? Jealousy and pride. <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's why I love you. And can you talk us to both for those? Yeah, I mean, we don't get nearly as many fans at Red Bull Arena. So if you're from New York and New Jersey and you're listening, come on through and bring your friends. That being said, I I'm so happy. I don't even think happy is the right word. I'm so proud of the people who believed in this league, this industry, these women, and the talent, skill level, and just overall quality of the game that we are actually presenting to get it to this point. To where on the West Coast, it is normalized. It is standard to have 15,000 fans in your stadium. And, that's, and soon it will be like, oh, my gosh, we didn't have 15K? What's going on? You guys need to step it up. It's not okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I can't wait to play at all three venues. I love what you've said. There are now three teams, Thorns and Angel City. And Thorns have been, you know, old school, been doing this forever, leading the way. Angel City building a delirious fan base also. 15 to 20K, almost guaranteed at all three venues it feels like the tectonic plates of the women's game are shifting before our eyes in a way we've all dreamed about now you do have three clubs guaranteed 15 to twenty thousand fans how does that feel as a player about the direction the women's game is going in this nation i think the women's game is only going to get bigger and bigger i think by the time i'm retired these kids are going to be selling out stadiums it's going to be really hard to get tickets these games are going to be normal sports games. But I, I really think that we're hitting a turning point in the next few years where it's just going to skyrocket. Oh, God willing, what you are saying is utterly truth. And I do believe the next decade is going to be the decade of women's football as the greatest story uh, in the game. Quick one from that game, Caitlin Sheridan. Wave goalkeeper, proving herself to be one of the most influential signings in 
the league this year, stopping her third penalty of the season Saturday night. We've talked a little bit about Sheridan before on this podcast, just the confidence that her presence of the back gives to the wave. Realistically, she's one of the best goalkeepers in the world right now. It's funny you asked me that because I was literally going to say Kaylin Sheridan is the best goalkeeper in the world right now. Virgos, my meld. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been saying this since I... I got to it was sky blue at the time now it's gotham but since i played with kaylin and trained with her in the off season she is absolutely incredible and it baffles me that she hasn't been given more credit and credibility for her her skill she's insane she has the ability to change an entire team she has the feet of a six it's insane she both she both of her feet are good left and right she has incredible shot stopping abilities she can cover so much ground in the goal she's incredibly athletic which is just a gift incredibly athletic and she's smart M- most of all i think kaylin similar to most of the best players in the game is her biggest critic and she's almost never satisfied with the performance she gives and she's always always pushing to to hit a new level and I think that mindset is what really has sustained her and gotten her to this point we are coming up on the final breath of this NWSL regular season just two weeks left to go still so much up in the air in this season oh chaos incredibly not a single team has managed to lock in their actual playoff spot yet dominoes will finally start falling this weekend. Saturday, 7 p.m., North Carolina go toe-to-toe with Midges Gotham. That game on Paramount+. Plus. North Carolina, in their five-year history, have never failed to qualify for those playoffs. They are fighting to keep that record intact, sitting in eighth for the moment, five points off Chicago in the final spot, but with an extra game in hand. Midge, I assume, do I even have to ask? You go with no mercy. I don't even know what what is mercy. Oh, welcome to my life, Midge. But then at 8.30 on Twitch, Ebony Salmon and the Houston Dash versus OL Reign. Again, if Houston win, they will be in the playoffs for the first bloody time in club history. Incredible. Godspeed to everyone there. Sunday, the Thorns versus the Red Stars at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Could be a make or break game for the Red Stars season. Perch precariously. Right now in that last playoff berth, then at 5 and 7 p.m. Eastern Time, respectively. Two games with enormous implications for the Shield as Kansas City take on the Spirit. Gotta can't wait for that game. And the San Diego Wave face Orlando Pride. A loss for them will mean oh, no playoff contention. 8 p.m. Angel City, that delirious mob, take on an already eliminated but dangerous-looking racing Louisville as they attempt to keep their inaugural season playoff dreams alive. All those games streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Try it for free at ParamountPlus.com slash M-I-B T-W-G. That's M-I-B T-W-G. Go on, get it. Two weeks to go in this season. Revel in every single beat of narrative. And that is it for this week. Midge. I will let you close out on our weekly note of light. This whole podcast has been a note of light in this dark, dark world. But tell us something that's bringing you joy this glorious Midge Purse birthday week. For my birthday, my boyfriend asked me what I wanted. And I said, one red velvet cupcake because I wanted to blow out one candle. That is all. You don't ask for much, Midge. I don't. (laughs) I'm very low maintenance. (laughs) He was unable to secure the one cupcake. So he decided to purchase 20 red velvet bunt cakes. <laughs> I am indifferent towards bunt cakes. <laughs> Don't worry, it gets it gets happy. My father <laughs> also purchased 12 bunt cakes <laughs> that are red velvet. Because he heard me tell my boyfriend that I wanted one red velvet cupcake. (laughs) I just received a message that the 32 red velvet bundt cakes have now arrived downstairs outside of my apartment. So that's that's my happy (laughs) story. (laughs) This is... 
this is one of the your birthday is one of the great great weeks for the bunt baking um industry solely solely you are trying to stave off the inflationary pressures on our society just to just through bunt cake acquisition midge that is just one of many things that makes you such an incredible human being i do aside from your red velvet the one so all i wanted in life that was a red velvet cupcake but when life gives you bunk cakes, that's what I could go on about this for a long time. I'm quite fascinated. <laughs> and I'm also going to be Googling bunk cake um, in the week. But I do find your desire to test yourself, try new things on and off the field. Honestly, truly inspirational. We wish you a year of health, of goals, of glory and creativity. Godspeed, Mitch. Thanks. Courage. Courage.